What's going on day, today, guys? This is uh, Tony and... This is Matt. And it's Team Divine Pro. And today on Kartaku, the very first episode, we will be talking about um, a spotlight. So as you'll probably find out by the end of this video that we're doing this for a shout-out slash spotlight video on Domino Paris 21's channel. So big shout-out to him and thanks to him for letting us be on his channel. So the questions we have to answer from him are... Four questions and then one topic that we choose from a three of, and we'll start this off with how long have you been playing this game? So, Matt, if you want to go first. Sure, I can go first. Well, basically, I first got started into this game when my friend accidentally stumbled upon the first episode on YouTube when he was flipping through some Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds episodes, and once he found it out, he immediately introduced it to me. So I got introduced to the game as soon as it got started, from the very first set one, uh, set to release in Japan. Um, I think I think that's pretty much the story. As soon as he got into it, he was like, "Dude, you got to get into this." I think it's so much more fun than Yu-Gi-Oh because he sort of jumped off the Yu-Gi-Oh bandwagon a long time ago. Dude, oh my gosh, it's actually it's funny that you say that because it's actually how legitimately I got into Card Fight Vanguard. I was like, I was watching Five Ds back in the day, and I was like. I was like looking up my and like I want to watch another episode, and I'm like, oh wait, what's this thing at the top? It's like, oh, Vanguard? I'm gonna, let me click on that. I'm like, whoa, this is actually hype. And then there was like 19 episodes released at that time, and I just like watched all 19 in one day. I, I, I marathoned it. I was like, oh, this is too good. Yeah, I think that's what my friend did, and next thing you know, he's like, dude, we all got to jump on this bus, because everything is like super cool. The concept is different. The, co the artwork is different. The whole storyline is completely different from what we were used to when... The only card games that were out at the time that were like super hyped were Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, Magic, which doesn't have a show, I don't think, and then some other oh, minor stuff. Yeah, that that like just the the show alone is enough. Like now, like I don't know if you about know about like We Cross, but like that's what they're pretty much copying. Like Vanguard is being copied a lot now, and I guess that's how people get into playing it. Like even before legitimate cards came out, I proxied cards. Like, I took Yu-Gi-Oh cards and put, like, pieces of paper in it. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna... These are my critical triggers. These are, like, my heal triggers. Oh, yeah, that's what we did. <laughs> we, we proxied our entire 50-card decks. He started out with Royals, and I started out with Oracle Think Tank. Too good, too good. Oh, yeah. How do you think of the new... Did you see the new Oracle Think Tank card? Like, the Legion? Oh, I'm in love with the new Legion. Actually, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, it I, gives I, CEO some much-needed life. Yeah, dude, I hated I hated the cross ride. The cross ride does not exist in my in my universe. <laughs> dude, the cross ride was like it's so good, but then like you you'll never get it off because you'll always get it blocked. And when you do get it off, you're already winning. So it's like it's not it's pointless. Pretty yeah. Much. Okay, but uh, yeah. Anyways, guys, um, before we keep on going, I like to mention that there's at least two more members of our team that are missing. So we have Matt, uh, Matt number, technically co-founder with me of Team Divine Pro. He's uh, unable to attend. And also we have Marcus, a.k.a. Scruffy Pillows, unable to attend as well. But they are here in spirit. And, you know, next time Kartaku rolls around, hopefully the A-team will be together again. Cue the A-team track, which is not going to happen because we're recording. <laughs> All right. So uh, next thing is... Oh, well, any other comments, Matt, before you move on, or is that it? No, I think that's pretty much it. Okay, so next thing is, why do you love Cardfight Vanguard? Um, my my first impression was because that, um, unlike I guess unlike Yu-Gi-Oh, you can pretty much find everything within a certain amount of sets rather than buying several, and um, mostly because of the artwork. Because me trying to be somewhat of an artist myself, I can really come to appreciate a lot of these people's art and how much detail they can put into these different art forms. Not not only that, but they can incorporate the the themes behind each clan into the artwork. So it it's not so much of a game to me as much as it is like I guess an art gallery for me. So I can better appreciate not only their skills but their background behind them since every card has a lore. Yeah. Actually, that's actually really true. Like I never know I never thought about that. Like yeah, guys, if you ever, like, want to see Matt's art, he's actually a really good artist. Like, I will say, so for myself, being, like, I like to draw and stuff as well, but I'm not as nearly as good as you are, Matt. But, like, yeah, if you want, he'll 
you know, like I think that you should upload some more like of your own art onto the Team Divine Pro channel um, Facebook page. Comment. Uh, they'll be in. It'll be in the comment section. I mean, description box down below if you want guys want to see that. But yeah, it, it's really about the art. Like I never thought about it that way, but really good thing. All right. What about you? Um, me. Why do I love it? Well, first off. I love it because it's not Yu-Gi-Oh! and it's not complicated and it's really easy. That's one of them. And the second one is that, like, it's just, when you play a card game like Yu-Gi-Oh! for so long and then you realize that you're just going to lose money every time you play the game, it's not worth it. And then when you when you see something like Cardfight Banger, it's like, oh, I can use this deck and I can still probably win most of the time consistently. And on top of that, it's just the fact that I enjoy animes that have like in, i enjoy card games that have animes devoted around the card game itself because like something like pokemon you'd expect to play you, like the, the ds game i understand that but the card game i wouldn't understand that if you know what i mean no i completely understand i'm, I'm yeah. basically in the same boat as you are with that explanation exactly so yeah but like what, what you said as well is really, like really really true like the reason why I really started getting into Carpet Banger was because I saw Dragonic Overlord, and I was like, "Wow, that looks really cool and really boss." And I was like, "Okay, I'll play that." So it's it it really is an art thing that gets you into it. Like you're not going to want to play Mega Colony because it's a bug. No, even though you it has play it because it catches your eye and you think, "Ooh, what does that do?" Because that's pretty much how everyone plays. They they see like say Nebula Lord is like, "Oh my gosh, that looks amazing! I'm going to play that because it's freaking broken and it looks cool." That's like the people's first impression. Actually, so true. All right. So uh, any, yeah, guys, uh, Card Fight Vanger, why we love it? We love it for the art and because it's fun and simple. Pretty much straight down the bones. So now uh, moving on, uh, what are your favorite decks? Okay. Um, I have to immediately say uh, Goddess of the Full Moon because that is the first deck that I I got introduced to with my friend. That was the first deck that I proxied all 50 cards, and Oracle Think Tank was this, the first deck that I started with because I think of myself more of like a defensive player. So when when I thought of a deck that had a draw power sort of theme, I my immediate thought rea uh, reaction was, oh, okay, if I can keep a certain amount of hand advantage, I'll be able to replenish my field in case that if I lose my resources, I can replenish them no at no uh, no cost or, or at any time. So that was my, that was my technical style. I'm more of a defensive player. But as the game has, I guess you can say, evolved over the two, three years that it's been around, um, I've actually come to like a lot of the uh, Zoo Nation clans, uh, more most particularly Great Nature and Neo Nectar, and Neo Nectar specifically Musketeers. Neo Nectar so good. I like the art. That, that that looks nice. It's like green and it's just just really nice. Pops at you. Oh, the I love the artwork for all the musketeers, especially for the new ones that are coming out in Japan. Ugh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> oh yeah, they're actually pretty nice. Yeah. So, any other decks, or should I go on? Um, no, I think that's. Oh well, and I guess you could say Pale Moon, but Pale Moon sort of got a little overhyped, and I on the way I'm playing it is different. But I'm only using that as a as a fun deck just to mess around at locals. You always need the troll deck. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's incredibly troll. I, with the break ride and Lecure, I've been able to pull off Lecure consistently within a fight, like, three, four times. That's impressive. Uh, so, moving on to me, I guess I could say... Well, my first deck and my first, like, one clan that I really like is Kagero, and I'd probably say anything revolves around the end. I... I don't feel that Nouvelle Vague, like, even though it's an amazing card, I don't love it as much as anything revolving around the end, just because of the fact that I find it's overhyped, and I just don't like the concept of having a grade 4 in the game and having something extremely broken like that, and that looks kind of ugly with really long legs. It's just weird to me. But I would probably say under the same cag category for Kagero, I would say the... Perdition, Perdition Dragons, like the new ones that are coming out for Vortex Dragon, because Vortex Dragon was so cool in the anime, and I was looking so forward to playing it, except I never got the Soul Blast off, and I, I was like, okay, I'm just going to trade this card away. I'll come back for it later. 
Yeah, Vortex, yeah. all the all the Mega Blasters for all the clans sort of got, um, I guess you could say, uh, overshadowed, yeah. And the only one that really got any sort of light was CEO, and it got it has two now, and one is better than the other, obviously. Yeah. Fun fact, though, Vortex Dragon was supposed to be the main dragon for Kai over Dragonic Overlord. Fun fact, fun fact. Dragonic Overlord got too much popularity. <laughs> That's probably true. That's probably why now, with uh, Ro- uh, Blaster Blade, spoilers, guys, for the anime if you haven't seen already, uh, Blaster Blade, when it gets taken away from Kai, he goes back to playing Kajiro probably, which is what a lot of people are speculating, which is off of BT-17. Um, and other decks would probably be Shadow Paladins, just because I like how Shadow Pal- Paladins like look in the Dark Dragon type of concept, and most specifically, I would probably just say Revengers, or anything with Phantom Blaster Overlord, so probably the new Revengers, not Raging Form, because that's kind of like, meh, I don't... Too hype, too hype. <laughs> I feel you. And apart from that, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I, I, I would say just like anything like Sanctuary, United Sanctuary, like Royals or like uh, Golds, just because of the fact that they look nice. But I don't like the gold top deck effect. But if anything, that if I were to pick three, it'd probably be between Minerva, Musketeers, or like, um, whatchamacallit, Walfred. So Big Alfred that looks like a mobile palace type of thing. Yeah. One. Okay, so personal opinion: on. Musketeers do what gold paladins do better. Oh my! Go- oh my gosh, that's actually true. Oh, oh my! Oh yeah, that's. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize. You that. can thank Marcus for that. Guys, you gotta get Marcus to come to the next one so that he can share his opinions in this. All right, all right. Okay, so uh, next question. What will subscribers expect to see from your channel? I think, Matt, you can go first, and I'll say second. Um, well, I'm having a little uh, problem trying to understand the question. What is it that we're trying to get at? What will subscribers expect to see? Like, what content will they expect to oh, see, I guess? Oh, well, okay. Well, if you're going to be watching the videos that I post, uh, I think you want to expect not a lot of the same because most deck profiles are going to be the same no matter what. It, the only difference is going to be like technical stuff, like within the grade one or grade two count. Um, but you're probably going to see like ingenuity in a sense. Like I already put up that Oracle Think Tank deck that was supposed to be not met necessarily tournament like ready, but you can definitely use it in casual play, and it can be definitely dangerous if you play it correctly. But I think that's sort of what you want to expect from me. Things that you wouldn't exactly expect from the general meta, I think. Like, a lot of the things that I did with Oracle Think Tank is I just started messing around. I know almost almost every combination because people are always going to come up with new combinations and new things. But I'm that one that wants to look at different ways to make the different combinations. So you're definitely going to see more sort of like a casual aspect rather than a meta, but my casual can also compete with the meta, That which is what I like about Vanguard, because you can sort of mix and match both and be able to like separate and come back together, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Well, yeah, if, if anybody, like, if you aren't subscribers of our channel already, you will, um, this is just a quick info little tip, um, that Matt and both Marcus are new to the channel and new to the team just because of the fact that we had previously more members, but they could not continue with the team because of reasons. So we extended our reach to other YouTubers slash Carfight Vanguard people. And yeah, so now he's on and he's doing a great job. He check out his videos on our channel, guys. Definitely great. Like it's it's refreshing in a way because it's more techy and more fun based yeah it's more definitely more relaxed i try to make it so that when i play i'm having fun with what i'm playing rather than i'm just trying to play what i'm playing because i want to win yeah and um quick little snippet we do do also <laughs> do do <laughs> all right <laughs> immaturity away um we also do waste wars guys and 
other card games. Like Matt does Yu-Gi-Oh on the side, and that's totally cool. You can find that in the channel as well a bit. And we also do Wage Wars, obviously, and that's what we do right now with Card Fight Vanguard. And it's possible that Marcus might get into We Cross, if any of you know that. Just letting you know that I don't even know if you knew that, Matt. If he, you knew that he was going to get We Cross. He talked to me the other day about it. I was like, wow. No, I, really? haven't had, cool. I haven't had a chance to catch up with him. Okay. Well, yeah, so we do a lot of different stuff, but Vanguard, we will be concentrating on that because we are getting more sets in Japanese out, and Matt's going to stay with the English format because he wants to. So that's pretty <laughs> cool. Yeah, pretty so, much. Yeah, um, I guess on my side of the things, the because I am pretty... If you'll see, the, I pretty much started the channel with Matt and... Uh, well, Matt number two and a bunch of other guys. So what you can look forward to seeing is pretty much... Nowadays, card, card fight Vanguard wise is Japanese card fight Vanguard content because, and English from Matt sides, but um, more of the meta type of Japan type of stuff, and hopefully some more stuff that is revolved around, like we do improving your game segments. So we want to help the mindset of the competitive player and tell you what is best to think about in a certain situation or what is best in, like a deck or ratios or how to help you improve just in general. But also, we like to do sometimes fun videos and, um, like, mail day unboxings. So, like, we do get a lot of stuff in, like, sleeves and all that. And we do do, like, vending type of thing. So we want to put a little bit of mix of everything, getting the anime in there, getting the card fight Vanguard, the waste, every little card game in there. Yeah. So it's a yeah. good all-around type of thing. Cause I think we want to don't sort really of have, like, a general understanding of everything. Like, I will probably be more focused on the English formatting, but... I- I am somewhat knowledgeable on the Japanese meta, so we can always talk about back and forth both the uh, English TCG versus the Japanese OCG. Uh, We want to be able to have a broad spectrum of knowledge for that you guys can always ask us and we'll always be able to have the answer. And if we don't have an answer, we can easily look it up and be able to tell you. Yeah, because, like, it's actually... Because, like, the North American Vanguard versus, like, the uh, the Japanese Eastern Vanguard is completely different because... They play a different style. Like even you, you can like, um, what's it called? Like copy a deck from um, from like somebody that just won WGP in Japan, but it might not work over here just because of the play style and all that. But that's since we play here and we understand the thinking behind every card they play in Japan, we should be able to help you guys and compare and say what would be best in a certain meta. Exactly. But yeah, if you if you haven't really noticed already, there's a lot of like artistic people on this channel, and we do want to get like lots of artsy stuff going. So we'll try to find some more fun things to do, like maybe like arts and crafts type of thing. Like I know that sounds really kid like, but you'll see what we mean at some point, like deck boxes and all that. So yeah, sounds good. Anything yeah. else? Anything else, Matt, or should I just go on to the topic? No, I think that's pretty much it. Okay, so out of the three topics we chose, guys. We picked, um, does this game involve more skill or luck? And as you can first read off from our slogan, Team Divine Pro, uh, no luck, all skill, I think you can kind of guess what we're going at right here. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, so, I'm I'm going to argue that it's going to be uh, more skill rather than luck. However, there is some element of luck, but that, oh, is, yeah, that, sure. is, true, that is true with any card game. Yeah, there's always the um, using luck. using Yu-Gi-Oh as an example. Say your opponent has a very large field, and you end up top decking Dark Hole. That's incredibly lucky. I mean, not very often are you going to top deck the key card that you need at that time, but it happens in any card game. So it takes skill in realizing what you need to play within a deck and what are your limitations within that deck. No, being knowledgeable about the cards that you're playing that's what takes skill. The other part that takes skill is being able to know what your opponent is playing and how their play style is like. Not just the not just the deck itself. Let's say I'm using Oracle Think Tank and my opponent is using Kagero. Not only do I need to know how my po- opponent personally plays, but I need to know how the cards themselves are played. That way I can counter to his counter. That's what's more skill-based, being able to strategize against your opponent so that you don't minus as much as your opponent. Other than that, the only thing that is lucky or luck-based is drawing or triggering your triggers. Yeah. So, like, 
that's really what it is. Like getting into your opponent's head and like thinking it out. So what it it's best sometimes, guys, to like even though you don't want to play a deck, you just play it just because of the fact that you want to know how that the ins and out of that deck how they go before you play against it. So that's really something that would be recommended to do. But as regard to like is it skill or luck, it's always there's always a factor of luck. It's just how much more luck is there in this game. But re- we're like relating back to what Matt said about skill in like top decking a certain card. It also takes a lot of skill to know the like how many cards like to count how many cards left you have in that deck and what your odds are to get that deck. Like say I had something that can allow me to counterblast two and draw one card. I need to know if I want to activate that ability or if I want to limit break or if I'm looking for a certain card in my deck, do I want to draw it now? Like will I be able to draw it just because of the fact that I have like say ten cards left in my deck? Or if I want to draw it uh, when I have 20 cards. You have to like know when to activate certain effects and when to read your opponent's like uh, body gestures and everything to know if they're in a bad situation and you can take advantage of it. So it's really a, like if you're, you're playing face-to-face, it takes a lot of skill. But when you're playing virtual, it's not very... I'll, I'll, I'll admit it, it's not very skill-based because all you have to do is figure out what to hit with columns. And then if you can rem- remember in your head if they checked a certain amount of triggers. Like, if they have three cards and you know that one's, like, a grade three and a perfect guard, then you probably have the win if you can push for it. Yeah. Virtual is a little different. You have to also keep uh, account for the RNG. Uh, yeah. That's always going to be a thing. Uh, believe it or not, like any other game, this is actually a numbers game. So one thing that you also want to keep in mind, and this is what uh, separates the incredibly skilled to the just learning or the just intermediate players is keeping track of how many cards they've used within a certain uh, parameter. So let's say they, you're guaranteed 16 triggers within a deck. If you know for a fact that they've used up eight, that means you have eight left in their deck. And considering how good or bad their deck compression is, you'd be able to use the statistics within the cards left in his deck to determine whether or not he's going to trigger or not. So you can safely guard or safely no guard without having any repercussion damage. Not to mention, you can also keep track of how many u- certain units he has left. So let's say he has a bed of your clone if he's ru- running Royal Paladins. If he has, if he runs four bed of yours and he's already wasted three, then you only know that there's one left and you don't have to worry about that specific unit anymore because that's probably going to be his heavy hitter. Now he's left with nothing. So you need to be able to uh, know or read what ex- what is constantly going on on the field because the nu- the number game becomes a very big issue and people don't always realize this. That is really true. Like numbers are hugely important in any game, guys. And like if you, it just takes skill and kind of like an ability to just like. Ask your opponents, like, how many triggers do you have in your, like, do you mind if I check your drop zone or anything? It takes skill to know when you have to activate certain abilities, as I've said before. And how Matt said, you just need to have a skill to know when to call out those perfect guards and when to call out a certain card, even though you want to have it for guard. Like, if it's, you need to know, you need to know when it's like your last turn and you, if you die here, it's, it's over, even if you have cards in your hand type of thing. Yeah, and despite how big your deck is and the cards in your hand, you are you do have limited resources. If you are at five damage and you're pushing for game, then you're only allowed how many counter blasts, how many cards in hand, how many attacks, depending on the triggers that you run. You need to keep everything into account because if you screw up even the slightest bit, that might turn out to be your biggest disadvantage. Uh, mi- misplaying could be a huge turnaround for the player that you that you may be playing. And if they want to be a dick and call final turn, then that is probably much deserved because you uh, made the wrong play at the wrong time. That's actually really true. Like, especially with, like, the new cards, guys, it's less room for error, and it takes more skill, like, the better players to know how to get around them. Like, say, like, taking your example for Kagiro and Oracle Think Tank. Now, like, if they're having Kagiro, and you know that... Uh, actually, let's, let's take, like, Link Joker, for example. Like, we'll take Glendios and, uh, say, your Oracle Think Tank. It would take a lot of... Most people, in a situation like that, they would just try to rush the opponent and try to kill them. But then, for a deck like Oracle Think Tank, you need to know your deck 
and how it plays if it's a rush deck or if it's a like a long term deck. And I would say that Oracle Think Tank's more of like a me- intermediate deck. So for Matt may say it'd be important for him to know that he needs to leave like at least maybe one or two like one or two rear guard spots open so that he can't world end you in the end and to leave room so that even if you get locked a few times, you still have room for a rear guard to attack. Exactly. You need to be able to your your deck's limitations is. If you're playing Link Joker, then you're pro- you're probably going to be very much a boss. Threat. Um, playing Oni Tank, you're probably going to be a little bit more conservative and wait it out. And if you're running Full Moon of the Goddess like I am, uh, you're probably going to wait a few turns before you actually get off your combo moves and get to your stack because obviously five cards at the bottom is incredibly cheating because <laughs> it's legal stacking. But you, you need to be able to recognize when it is that is what am I trying to say, uh, when it is appropriate to activate everything. So it's just, uh, it's a mindset. You have to make it a mindset. It is definitely a mindset. Like, even the mulligan, it's a mindset. Like, you need to know what you want to send back and what you don't, especially, like, if you're if you're running a ride chain, say, like, the blaster, like, the Phantom Blaster Overlord ride chain, or, like, say, the full moon thing, if you have, like, nothing of the ride chain in your hand and you have a grade one, you just keep the one grade one and send everything back just so that you can try to get the ride chain going. But you still ensure that you have a grade one for that turn. Yeah, because God knows how many times I've missed the ride chain and it hurt me so much. Exactly. It's really bad. Like, it it sucks when that happens, but, like, it's, it's, a, it's a thing about the game. That, that's the luck. That's the luck factor right there. But if you've built your deck properly, then you can't really say that I play. I did not play to the best of my abilities, so it's it all ends down to luck. But it is, it does more involve from everything from a deck building to the playing, just skill. I think a little advice is before you get the deck uh, and figure out how it plays. Figure out how you play specifically because if within a certain uh, a certain way, and your deck, you and your deck just don't exactly click like something's going on, then it's probably uh, a some probably switch and try something else. Because, for example, I didn't o- always like Pale Moon. I was like, nah, I don't want to waste the time and like pick up the cards and build a deck of my own. Once I picked it up, I was like, this deck is so much fun. I can't believe I didn't pick it up sooner. Ooh. What's going on here? You know. Yeah. So that it's it's a lot easier too nowadays. Well, yeah, because a lot of the stuff is more sort of readily available. But yeah, and you need online. Yeah, you need to be able to just recognize who you are as a player and what the deck can provide for you. Because like, the deck, in its essence, is basically a uh, extension of yourself. Yeah, exactly. So, like, guys, if you want to know, like, like I've seen people beat. Like Nouvelle Vague with like the like Oracle Think Tank. Like I'm I'm not picking on Oracle Think Tank or anything, but just like that first thing first thing that came to my mind, just because the person knew how to play the deck and like they knew like they put in their own text because they knew how to make the plays and everything and like it's just basically if you want to play test something, you can ask your friends and then they'll tell you it's like oh I it's like oh I I like to play more aggressive and I like to push harder. Then it's like okay maybe you're good for Spike Brothers, but like. If you're not too sure about it and you don't have any anybody to go ask about, then you can always just go online and look it up and then see, like, start playing online. Because I know that they have online versions now, not as good as beforehand, but they still have them and that you can still use them and you can still try it out. If not, then just ask to borrow a deck or just maybe shuttle in a bit of money, but first ask your friend's opinions and see. Or you can ask us because, you know, Team Divine Pro, no luck, all skill. We're always here for you. <laughs> All right. So is, is anything else, Matt, before we uh, conclude this podcast? No, I think that's a pretty good uh, ending to a first episode. All right. So, yeah, guys. So this has been Team Divine Pro with a spotlight video talking, answering questions uh, from Domino Paris 21. Big shout out to him for letting us be on the channel. Thanks again. And this has been Tony and... This is Matt. Signing off. Later. See you guys.